So, you're saying she's barren? My mother was crying. The doctor winces. That's not the first word I would use, but she is infertile, yes. She turns to me. I'm sorry, Lorelai, but this early menopause is irreversible. You're not going to be able to have biological children when you're older. My mother lets out another sob and clasps her hands over her mouth. She's shaking. I turn to her and hesitantly placed a gentle hand onto her back, rubbing smooth circles onto her shoulder blade with my thumb. It's going to be okay, I soothe. It's not the end of the world. She was making this really big fucking deal. Yeah, it's not great, but come on, I'm 17 and not really too worried about my status as a childbearer when I'm older. And hey, not getting a period for the rest of my life sounds like a pretty sweet deal. So there were no tears from my eyes when I heard the news, but mom is wailing like I had just been diagnosed with a brain tumor. I make eye contact with the doctor and give a half-hearted shrug. She looks away. The only sound in the examination room is the cry of my mother. A few days later, and she's still not out of her funk, the door to her bedroom is shut and locked, and despite my persistent knocking, she refuses to answer, her endless cries wafting through the wood and reverberating through the rest of the house. I pour some boxed pasta into the pot and wince as the water splashes over, the stove hissing in protest. Sadie, my younger sister of four years, watches from the kitchen table. I'm sick of pasta, she snorts. I roll my eyes. You don't like it, you cook for yourself. Ever since the news, Mom hasn't done anything. Eating, showering, talking. It's so unlike her. She's always been the most resilient woman I've ever known. A supermom, taking on the role of both mother and father for Sadie and I, after our dad passed away. A pang of guilt settles into my chest as a noticeably loud sob bounces through the kitchen. Sadie groans. All this over your broken uterus? I bark out a laugh. Yeah, I guess she's pissed I can't be an incubator for her grandkids. Over our buttered pasta, we listen as Mom's sighs settle down and finally subside, which we assume means she fell into a listless sleep. That's been her routine the past three days. Cry, sleep, cry some more. I interrupt the silence. You done your homework yet? Sadie rolls her eyes. Yes, Mom. Just looking out for you. You don't want to be a family disappointment, too. Her eyes soften at that. You're not a disappointment, Lori. It's not your... She is interrupted by a knock at the door. We are interrupted again by an even more surprising sound. Our mother's bed creaking as she bounds out of bed, through her door and to the foyer, throwing open the front door with a flourish. A gaze from the kitchen. A man I have never seen before stands in the doorway, balding and gray, a satchel on his hip and round glasses on his face. Nathan, she says, relief evident in her voice. Please come in. Nathan enters the house, and they both enter the kitchen where Sadie and I are finishing up our pasta. My mother looks awful. Heavy bags under her eyes, hair frazzled and thinning, eyes red and bloodshot, still leaking with tears. But she musters a smile for the first time in what seemed like ages. Lori, Sadie, meet Nathan, a friend of mine. Um, hi, I respond, and Sadie follows suit. Would you like some pasta? Nathan chuckled humorlessly. No thank you, dear. His voice immediately puts me on edge. It's nice to meet you two. Your mother has told me wonderful things. Sadie was never one for subtleties. Mom, she says, who is this and why is he here? Nathan laughs and my mom blushes. Be polite, girls. Nathan is here to help us. We're going to head to my office, all of us. 
I cocked my head, confused. We had never been allowed in Mom's office, ever. Strictly off limits, always locked. I was told it was because there were important legal documents, Mom was a lawyer, that she didn't want our hands on. Your office? I repeat, hesitantly. I glance at Sadie. Blatant confusion is written on her face as well. Yes, my mother responds, now impatient. Come on now, we don't have time to waste. The four of us trek up the stairs to the second floor and head for the door. Mom disappears for a moment and returns with a key, rusted and silver, as if speckled with orange. She shoves the key in the lock and turns, opening the door with a solid creak. What the fuck? Sadie whispers, and I don't even hear my mother reprimand her over the buzzing in my head. I've never seen anything like this. The walls are stained with crimson messages, which I pray are in paint rather than blood. He is coming. At dawn he will rise. Death to the non-believers. She who bears the sun will be blessed. Wooden totems litter the floor, pulled together with broken bones and filthy string. The skeleton of what looks to be a sheep slumps in the corner, like a toddler in time out. A pentagram beats down from the ceiling like a sun. My mom sighs. Girls, you were meant to find this out later, but mitigating circumstances have arisen. Her eyes survey the room, filled with pride, as she straightens her posture and finally glances at my sister and I. Our family is special, howbeit unlucky. We have been blessed with the blood of Lucifer in every cell of our bodies, down a long lineage, and we have lived to serve him as his children. And as such, we owe him the gift only we as women can give, his vessel to earth, his child. Sorry, what? I stutter, eyes fixed on the sheep carcass. He needs a son. The death of your father was punishment for bearing two daughters. I fear his next punishment may be worse. She glances at me, tears filling her eyes once more. Lorelai, we were so close, until you were barren. Perhaps this is a test of my loyalty. Sadie and I make eye contact and turn towards the door, and Nathan moves to block it, his frame taking up the doorway, arms crossed over his chest. I fear there is no time to waste, my mother continues. Who knows what the next few years will bring, which is why I brought Nathan to give Sadie a child before all hope is lost. What? Sadie shrieks, and I feel my jaw drop. You're fucking insane, I scream. You're fucking crazy. This fucking creep is not going to rape my sister. Adrenaline rushing through my veins, I turn to where Nathan stands, hands reaching for his zipper as my mother approaches Sadie. No fucking way, I scream. The next moments seem like a blur. Sadie begins to sob as my mother braces her hands on her shoulders. Nathan's fly goes down as he fumbles with the zipper, and my foot, in Doc Martin's, collides straight with his groin as hard as I could, eliciting a groan as he crumples to the floor. Fucking pervert! I scream. As he withers, my eyes scan the floor for something, anything. Spying a large bone on the ground, what looks like a femur, I lug it into my arms, struggling against its weight. I whip back around at my mother, who is attempting to restrain a screaming Sadie, before I swing the bone around my head and smash it against her skull. She falls as well, and I waste no time grabbing Sadie's hand and rushing out the door. As we race down the stairs, my mother's straggled voice follows us. You won't get away, you fucking horse. We are all over the world, and we will serve our father. Sadie is sobbing as I throw open the front door and we run into the night, destination nowhere. I have no fucking idea where to go from here, 
and I swear I feel like something is watching us. I think we are monumentally screwed. I have Sadie's hand in a death grip as we stumble down the driveway and make a break for it down the street. Her cries have been replaced with sputters and gasps for air as I pull her along. Come on, I huff. We got to get out of here. Where are we going? I hear Sadie's shrill voice behind me, nearly wheezing as she pushes the words out. Where are we going? Good question. The police. That's what the cops are there for, right? My free hand fumbles with my cell phone as I swipe for the emergency call, tapping 911 with my thumb. And then I stop. What the hell am I supposed to say? Hi, yes, my mother and her rapist friends are devil worshippers and are trying to impregnate my 13-year-old sister. Hello, officer. Funny story. Now that I'm sterile and can't have grandkids, my mom's plotting my death in her office-turned-Satan fan club. Yes, that is correct. A balding Satanist is creeping on my minor sister, and I inverted his nuts with my Doc Martens. How would they believe me? And worse... What if they separated Sadie and I? Worse still, what if the cops are in on it too? Am I paranoid? Cautious? Both? One thing is for sure. We have to get far away. Our mother is prolific in our district, a member of the Parent-Teacher Association, a cult in itself, and the neighbor on the block always willing to lend a hand. My eyes scan the wallet phone case, spying my debit card and a few crumpled dollar bills. Lori, stop! Sadie gasps, and we pause in our tracks. We're on a main road now, which makes me feel safer, but we're alone and desperate with roughly three dollars to our name. I look down at my sister. Snot runs down her face to her chin. Her hair is disheveled, more brown curls out of her ponytail than in it. Cheeks red, eyes bloodshot, she reminds me of my mother locked in her room, crying over me. Me. Listen, I start. We're going to be fine. This is what we're going to... She interrupts. I don't want a baby. And you won't fucking have one, I hiss. But you have to do as I say. This is what we're going to do. We're going into that 7-Eleven down the block and taking out as much money as it'll let me. We're leaving my card there, and we're going to hitch a bus and take it as far as it'll go, and we're going to find a church. A church? Sadie questions, breathing beginning to level. Yeah, I respond, taking her clammy hand in mine as we march towards the 7-Eleven. If anyone knows how to deal with, uh demon babies. It would be a priest, right? The blinding lights of the 7-Eleven make me wince as we enter, a stark contrast to the inky night. We make a beeline for the ATM, and I shove my debit card inside. My first card, with a silly beach scene on the front, slightly cracked. Mom sat with me at the bank when I registered for it, after making some good money working a summer camp when I was 15. She was really proud of me. You're turning into such a fine young woman, Lorelai. I punch in my pin as Sadie shakes her head wildly. Lori, you don't actually believe this, do you? Like, we're not possessed by the devil. Mom is just nuts. Sadie, I don't know, but it's the only thing I can think of right now. I refuse to believe that my mother is a delusional loon but I also refuse to believe that I'm the devil incarnate. As I wait for the ATM to spit out my life savings, I take inventory of the people in the 7-Eleven. The young cashier scrolling through her phone, a bored look plastered on her face. Two teenage boys by the Slurpee machine, blue raspberry slushy filling a tall cup. An elderly gentleman is scanning the candy near the checkout counter, glasses poised at the tip of his nose. We make eye contact. I look away, quickly, my eyes burning a hole into the ground. It could be nothing. 
you make eye contact with strangers all the time. Or it could be something. I'm pretty sure I can outrun Carl from up, but I'm not about to take any chances. Time to go, Sadie. I bark as I drag her out of the store, avoiding the man's gaze, shoving my debit card behind a six-pack of Orbit gum as we leave. Okay, deep breath. You got this, Lori. Bus stop a few blocks down. I can catch the next one if I put some pep in my step. Bus. Church. Planned Parenthood. I need to get Sadie on the pill. Christ, forcing my sister on birth control was not on my agenda for this week, but I have to do something in case of the unspeakable. Beats a coat hanger abortion any day of the week. The thought makes me sick to my stomach as Sadie and I board the bus, shoving our fare at the driver and shuffling to a seat near the middle. The bus is crowded for a Thursday night, and for that I don't know whether to be grateful or not. The bus roars to life and I pitch forward slightly, lost in thought, and my sister shoots me a concerned glance. She looks terrified, and I don't blame her. I'm pretty damn terrified myself, and I wasn't nearly assaulted 30 minutes prior. I place my hand on her knee and rub circles with my thumb over her jeans, the way I did when she was small, and I couldn't get her to stop crying. She settles slightly, and I inwardly smile. After all these years, I still have the magic touch. We're fine, I murmur. Keep your head down. We're getting off at the last stop, okay? No way they're going to be able to find us now. I try to lighten the mood. Hey, at least you won't have to go to school tomorrow, right? Get to miss that English presentation you've been complaining about. Sadie cracks a smile, and we settle into some sort of silence. Save for the idle chatter on the bus, the methodical starts and stops music softly wafting out of a kid's pair of headphones a few rows back. It's the first sense of calm I've felt since this whole mess started. Just two girls on a bus, on the way to church for a nice sermon on a Thursday evening. That's when I notice the bus driver in the front window. Our eyes meet before he glances back to the road, back to me. Road again. Me. There's a strange glint in his eyes that I cannot place. A similar look as the man in the 7-Eleven, and a look that I didn't like. His eyes stay on me for a second too long, then flicker to Sadie, and I make an executive choice. We're getting off at the next stop, I mutter. Sadie looks at me quizzically. Why? Because I fucking said so, and we do what I say. The words came out harsher than I intended, and my sister flinches slightly and sinks in her seat. Okay, Lori, new plan. Get off the bus, get away from the bus, and find the nearest church. Suddenly, the bus seems to slow, then stop, pulling off to the side of a barren street. The driver takes the key out of the ignition. The passengers grumble in annoyance, and I know this isn't engine trouble. My suspicions are confirmed when the bus driver stands and turns, waving a pistol in the air. Phone's down, he screams. If I see a phone in the air, you'll see a bullet in your brain. Screams erupt from the passengers, and I realize Sadie is screaming too. The driver starts a purposeful walk down the aisle, and I shoot out of my seat, pulling Sadie to her feet with me. The barrel of the gun is pointed straight at my forehead. I've never seen a gun before, not in real life, and the bubbling fear I'm trying to suppress is boiling to the surface. I will myself not to cry as the driver stalks to our row, taking a protecting stance in front of my sister. The driver looks normal, young, probably mid-thirties, crew haircut, Green eyes that I would find lovely, was he not preparing to shoot me point blank. The screams have died down to quiet murmurs and stifled cries. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a teenage girl two rows forward, about my age with a backpack in her lap, slide her cell phone out of her pocket. The driver notices too, 
and a tremendous bang nearly shatters my eardrums. Blood sprays against the window seat with a sickening splash, thick red currents pumping out of a hole in the girl's head. She's wearing a halo of brain matter as she slumps against the window and sinks down her seat. The window shatters, shards of glass falling all directions. Vomiting, screaming, the man's eyes on me again. I fight the urge to gag, to cry. I have to be the rock here, because if I crumble, there's no hope for Sadie. Listen, honey, hand over the girl and no one else has to get hurt. Suck a chode, I respond, gripping my sobbing sister's arm. I won't hesitate to shoot you, he continues. Your womb is worthless to us now. We just need the girl. His eyes flicker to Sadie. Young lady, it's time to serve a purpose greater than yourself. I'm panicking. There's no way in hell I'm handing over my sister. But I'm cornered and... Stupid, stupid Lori. Never should have taken the bus. Come on! The man shakes me out of my thoughts. He grits his teeth. I don't have fucking time for this. Suddenly, I spring to life, wrapping my bicep around Sadie's neck as she squeals and swooping down to grab a shard of glass on the bus floor from the window. I hold it to Sadie's neck as she writhes in my grip, whimpering. I'll fucking kill her, I hiss. I'll slit her throat right here. No Sadie, no fucking baby. The man hesitates, fumbling with his gun. Stop, I scream. You put down your fucking weapon right now, or this glass goes to her jugular. Lori, she squeals, and I feel a pang of guilt. I press my elbow to her throat harder, and I feel her pulse under my skin. Fast, erratic, her heart is pounding. I can almost see the gears turning in the man's head as he looks from Sadie to me. Now, I scream, laying the glass to the side of her neck and nicking her skin. A drop of blood leaks from the wound, bright and cherry, and drips onto the floor, leaving a small splatter between us and our assailant. The gun falls from the man's hands, and he's staring in horror, a deer in the headlights. In a sick way, I feel sort of powerful, in control for the first time in what seems like ages, even if it means using Sadie as a pawn. Okay, I continue. We're going to fucking leave now, and you're not going to follow us, or she fucking gets it, you hear? I don't wait for his response, filled with a foreign confidence as I march down the aisle, Sadie in tow. We step off the bus, and I'm almost in tears as we make a break once more. I'm nearly dragging Sadie with me, holding her to me like a human shield. In a sick sort of way, she is one. She's sobbing again. I'm sorry, I coo. I had to. I didn't mean it. No one is going to lay a hand on you. I pick up the pace as we race through a residential neighborhood and emerge on the other side of a main road. Past grand brick houses hand-printed mailboxes, a dog or two barking behind the confines of an electric fence. For once, luck is on my side, and I spy it. The church. St. David. At this point, it could be the flying spaghetti monster for all I care, as long as it does the job. When we reach the door, I throw my body against it, the gravity of what I've done taking over as I sob. I feel bile rise up in my throat, and I gag, resisting the urge to vomit on Jesus' doorstep. I slam my fists against the door, yelling. Open the door, I scream. Open the door right now, bastards. As I break into sobs, there is music to my ears. The heavy church door swings open, its warmth engulfing me almost instantly a stark contrast from the bitter cold and fear outside. A man stands on the other side, smiling, decked out in a cassock. 
There is a twinkle in his eyes, one that I cannot yet place. Lorelai, Sadie, he smiles warmly. We've been expecting you. Please, come in. The man ushers Sadie and I inside the church, the door slamming behind us with a grand sweep. We trek down the aisle, Sadie's hand, small and sweaty in mine, and I take a moment to look around. I had never been in an actual church before. I've seen them on television, sure, but we weren't raised religious, for obvious reasons, I suppose. It's different in real life. The colors on the stained glass windows still penetrate through the dark of the night, and the ceiling is tall, so tall. I feel a sudden pang in my head and realize how exhausted I must be, parched too. The man, priest, is it okay to call him a man? I don't know. Leads us down the aisle, past the altar, and into a small room near the back of the church. Nearly barren, save for a large cabinet, a couple of chairs, and a rickety wooden desk in the corner, barely balancing on its skinny legs. Please sit down, the priest tells us, motioning to the chairs. Hesitantly, I sink into one, and Sadie follows suit. The priest gives us a once-over. I imagine we look like a hot mess. I can feel sweat dripping down my face drying in my hair and wetting the back of my shirt. My sister is still crying, softer this time, but it breaks my heart nevertheless. Would you like some water, something to eat? The priest asks. What? Sadie starts, but I interrupt her. No thank you. A strange feeling is growing in my stomach, and as thirsty as I am, I can't bring myself to trust this man. We're fine, I assert, glancing guiltily at my sister as she shrinks into her chair. The priest gives us a kind look. Please, he says, let me at least give some first aid supplies for your sister. I look at Sadie with a start. Blood is trickling slowly down her neck. I wince because I did that to her, my sister. I'm supposed to be protecting her. Guilt churns in my stomach, along with whatever uneasy feeling is settling in my gut as well. I want to be sick. Sadie shakes her head, pressing her sleeve to the wound. It's fine, she says. Lori, it's fine, she repeats. I realize that I'm shaking. This is so fucked. You're barely protecting your sister. You almost slit her throat. Would you have slit her throat had the man reached to pull the trigger? Are you of the devil, Lorelei? The priest interrupts my thoughts. Very well, he says. My name is Father Vincent. As I've said, we've been expecting you. Who is we? I question. And how do you know our names? Father Vincent exhales. By we, I mean the church. We figured you'd be turning up to one of us, so we've been waiting. And as for your names, well, you're pretty well known around here. He cracks a smile. Almost famous, you might say. I narrow my eyes. Famous how? Father Vincent continues. A new sweat is breaking on my brow, and I move to wipe it with the back of my hand. It feels hot to the touch. Well, as you've probably heard, you've come from a pretty long lineage of Satan worshippers. Your mother is one of their most prominent, but something separates your lineage from the rest of them. And what might that be? I ask. Lorelei, isn't it obvious? The priest and I lock eyes. Somewhere along your bloodline, an incarnate of the devil intertwined his blood with your family. They have locked you into a prophecy and cursed your lineage. People like your mother are depending on you to bring them the second coming, Lucifer in the flesh, to lead them once more. 
I resist the urge to scoff. So, you're saying I'm related to the devil, and so is Sadie? The priest squints. It's more complicated than that, but yes, Lucifer's followers are depending on a woman in the family to provide the Antichrist as a vessel, and fortunately, or unfortunately, the vessel must be a biological male, which is why neither of you fit the bill, and your mother doesn't either. So now, the only way for the Antichrist to be born is... Father Vincent interrupts. Sadie. The only way for the Antichrist to be born is Sadie. When God froze your womb, Lorelai, he has spared you the danger of carrying this baby. He glances to my sister. Sadie, on the other hand, was not so lucky, and now your mother and the other followers are panicking. They fear that God will strike again, which is why they are desperate to impregnate your sister before that can happen. Sadie sniffles, then hiccups. I move my hand to rest on her knee. My head hurts, worse now. This is fucking crazy. Father Vincent smiles warmly. I am glad that you two are unlike your mother and have found us here. We can protect you if you let us. On holy ground, your mother cannot hurt you. This is insane, I mutter, and Father Vincent nods slowly, sympathy filling his eyes. Okay, so let's just say that this guy is telling the truth. If God isn't going to help Sadie out, modern medicine is going to have to do the trick. Okay, I say. So, we'll give Sadie a hysterectomy. What is that? Sadie squeals. Chill, I tell her. It just means we get a doctor to take out your uterus so you can't have a child. No uterus, no baby, no antichrist. It's simple. I look to Father Vincent. That'll work, right? There's that look again, in Father Vincent's eyes, that I cannot place. My head feels full of cotton, and I shake it quickly, clearing my vision. Right? Father Vincent nods slowly. Yes, if we sterilize your sister, she cannot have the baby. Therefore, the second coming cannot be born. I am flooded with relief. Okay, awesome. So, we can go to a hospital or something, or get a doctor over here? You guys have doctors, right? I'm afraid it's not that simple, said the priest, and my head snaps up, locking eyes with him. A sharp pain runs down my spine, and I will myself to ignore it. I glance at Sadie, and she is sweating buckets, quivering in her chair. Father Vincent rises from his chair and walks to me. A long finger is placed under my chin, and he raises my head so that I am looking into his eyes. He smiles again, but it throws me off guard. It is sad and sweet, sympathetic but maliced. He moves his finger and my head drops, a cough rattling through my throat. I am afraid that if we just sterilize your sister, Satan's hatred will manifest in other ways. I am also afraid it already has. How are you feeling, Lorelai? I feel like shit. My head is swimming. I try to swallow, but I can't because my throat is so goddamn dry. I rest my hands on my knees and bend forward, beads of sweat dripping onto my thighs. I can hear Sadie whimpering from the chair next to me, but I cannot turn to see her because my neck is so goddamn stiff. Exactly whispers Father Vincent. While you may not be a vessel, on holy ground, your devil's blood is boiling. You are dangerous. You are a manifestation of evil, womb or no womb, and I am afraid that no hysterectomy will save you from that, my dear. Sadie, I choke. Run! Father Vincent scoffs. Don't be afraid. We are not evil. And I promise, 
Once we take some of your tainted blood for personal purposes, your death will be quick and painless. Perhaps the Lord will reward you for your good deeds by opening the kingdom of heaven, or at least not damning you to hell with your followers. No, I choke. They're not killing Sadie. Sadie's thirteen. She's never kissed a boy, or girl, who am I to judge? Or driven a car, or went to prom. She's not lived her life and I'll be damned if some religious fruitcake kills her over a red guy with horns. With the thought of my sister, a burst of energy racks my body, and I rise from my chair, swinging at Father Vincent with every ounce of my strength. Try as I might, I've never thrown a punch in my life, and with that aside, my swing is weak and clumsy. I don't even touch him before my knees give out and I sink to the floor a groan escaping my lips. Lori, Sadie squeals, throwing herself from her own chair, landing in a heap by my side. Father Vincent kneels beside us, taking a gentle hand to tuck a clump of damp strands of hair behind my ear. We will be having company soon, he whispers, and arrangements will be made then. But for now, I need you to cooperate. Reaching into his robe, he pulls out a small vial, slowly unscrewing it with soft and slow hands. Dripping some liquid onto his fingers, he reaches towards my face. I flinch, but to no avail, as he wipes the sweat from my brow. As his hand touches my face, I'm screaming, writhing, throwing my arms in the air as I attempt to remove him from my body. My arms aren't working properly. They're twitching in different directions. My head is on fucking fire. I feel like my brain is sizzling, as if it is going to melt through my skull. I finally find it in me to look for Sadie. As my head snaps to the right, I see her, brown hair astray, retching at my side. Father Vincent's hands caressing, massaging her scalp as she yelps for mercy. Her skin is reddening as if she was burned. One of her small hands finds Father Vincent's, and she attempts to wrench his hand from her scalp. She's no match for him. She's thirteen. Thirteen. And it's my job to fight him off, but I can't. Save her. Save her, Lori. Save your sister. You promised nothing would happen to her. Do it, Lorelai but I can't. You know, I've made a lot of dumb decisions in my life. I snuck out of my window and down the side of the house when I was 14 to meet a boy, falling six feet and breaking my ankle. I cheated on a chemistry test, freshman year of high school, got caught, and was rewarded with a big fat zero. I spread that rumor about Katie from Algebra, I pulled my sister's hair when I was little and hid her Barbies around the house. I screamed at my dad the night before he died for leaving my mom. But this was probably the dumbest, going to this church. And that is my final thought before unconsciousness takes its hold and my eyes flutter shut. When I wake up, there is a horrible ringing in my ears. The back of my throat is tremendously dry. I try to swallow. My tongue feels like sandpaper. It reminds me of that one time my friend Zoe and I raided Mom's liquor cabinet and took swigs of some bougie-looking vodka, only to wake up with a raging hangover. Mom was so cool about it, too. Kids will be kids, she laughed. But maybe lay off the Sambuca and start with some White Claws until you can hold your liquor. Yeah, I feel like shit, but I am not dead. Cool. Nice. Sadie. I raise my head from the floor and swivel myself back and forth. I don't see her. If Sadie's gone, I might as well be too, because it was my job to protect her. Quite frankly, I'm doing a pretty shitty job at it, but to be fair, nailing Nathan in the balls was pretty sick. 
Okay, now is not the time to feel bad for yourself. Now is the time to find Sadie and get the hell out of here before you meet your maker. I pull myself off of the floor and stumble towards the door. A wave of vertigo hits me, hard, and I fight the urge to pitch forward, grasping the doorknob for support. I shake my head to clear the fuzziness creeping in from the corners of my eyes. Despite the aching in my head and the wobbliness in my legs, my mind is racing a mile a minute. If I really am descendant of the devil, does that mean I'm evil? Like, sure, I'm no saint, but I've never really done anything horribly wrong, save for cheating on a couple tests and spreading some rumors. I've seen movies where the Antichrist summons storms and kills puppies and shit like that, and I'm scared of thunder and cry during every ASPCA commercial. It just doesn't make sense. Unless, of course, they're all a bunch of loons and Mom needs to be committed. But then why on earth would I feel so sick as soon as I stepped into this church? Never mind that. My focus is on finding Sadie. I swing open the door and face the blinding lights of the church, squinting as I adjust to my surroundings. My eyes flicker from the dazzling chandelier to the stained glass windows, the first ounces of daylight slowly trickling in. My eyes scan the pews, up the aisle, and I fear that I may have lost her, that it was too late. That is, until I hear, Lorelai. It is a soft whisper, but the voice is unmistakable. It's the same voice that pleaded to me on the bus, snorted at my boxed pasta, cried to me as I held her hand and pulled her down the driveway. My head snaps to the altar, a mere ten feet away. I don't know how I didn't see it before. Tall and proud, and now slicked with blood. There stood my sister, shaking and covered in blood. Sticky, brownish red, stains her hair and crimps it at its ends. It drips down her shirt and to her toes, her white converse soaking it up and dampening with every waking second. I resist the urge to gag and run to her, throwing my arms around her and squeezing her tight. Sadie, I cry, pulling away and scanning her body, looking for any sign of injury. If there was, I couldn't see it because she was saturated. She looked like something out of a horror movie. But behind the gore, was my sweet and innocent Sadie, who didn't deserve this shit. Are you hurt? What happened? Where is he? Sadie is absolutely silent. I notice that she is quivering. I shake her gently. Sadie, talk to me. Where is Vincent? Did he hurt you? Whose blood is this? Sadie finally responds raising a shaking finger to point behind the altar. Now, I finally let my stomach go and retch onto the floor. My system is empty, so nothing comes out except for bile and my ragged breaths. I've seen some fucked up shit over the past 24 hours, but nothing could prepare me for this. It's Father Vincent, all right, but he's split in two. His body is severed right at his navel, his upper half propped against the altar, his lower splayed against the opposite wall. His blood is no longer pumping. Rather, it was spilling out of his exposed tendons and veins, slickening the floor, its pool growing bigger. The man's stomach is ripped open as if it were a pillow cut in two, stuffing falling out. God knows what blossoms from the organ and marinates in his blood. I can see the bone sticking out from his thigh. His eyes are wide open and bloody, and on his face is a look of shock and fear I have never seen. In the middle of the mess was a knife. However, it is not bloody at all, only splashed by Father Vincent's mess. I clap my hands over my mouth, what happened? 
Sadie says nothing. I turn to her and shake her once more, harder this time. Sadie, talk to me. Sadie slowly turns towards me, and her eyes are full of tears. He... he wanted to kill me. He pinned me on the altar. The knife was right at my throat. It was right there. She starts to sob, and I wrap my arms around her, wincing as I feel Father Vincent's blood soak into my t-shirt. It's okay, I coo. You're safe. I cringe as I hear my voice. There is no way in hell that we're safe, and I think we both know that by now. Everyone is out to either kill us or knock up my sister, and probably kill me after. Sadie continues to blubber. I was so scared. I thought I was going to die, and and I felt something weird in my chest. I screamed. I wouldn't stop screaming. And he put his hand over my mouth, and then... She's shrieking now, and I shush into her hair. Then he exploded. I wanted him to stop, begged in my head for him to stop. He exploded. Something tore him apart. Her voice grows even shriller. I think I tore him apart. I killed him. My mind killed him. I shook my head. Sadie, that's impossible. You couldn't have killed him. He just died. My voice trails off because I have no explanation for what the hell just happened. My confusion and fear couples with my relief that Sadie isn't dead, her pulse frantic but steady as she quivers in my arms. Lori, she whispers. I wanted him to die, and it felt good. I'm evil, Lori. Sadie, stop, I said. It was self-defense. Even if you did kill him, somehow. It was self-defense. He wanted to kill you. You saved us. I couldn't wrap my head around it. How could my sister, thirteen... Five feet tall and one hundred pounds soaking wet. Rip a grown man in half. While she was pinned onto a table. It doesn't make sense. She doesn't make sense. She can't even throw a football for God's sake. How the fuck did she rip this dude in half? I killed him! Sadie screams. My headache is getting worse again as her voice pierces my ears. We need to get out of here now. Didn't Father Vincent say more were coming? More people who wanted to fucking kill us? Shut up, I cry, the pangs in my head only growing worse. Sadie stops shrieking, but her sobs don't subside, only grow deeper and softer. We're leaving now. Everything is fine. I'm going to call 911. They'll put us in witness protection or something. Sadie gives me an incredulous look. Witness protection? Lori, everyone wants us dead. You have a better idea? I grapple for my phone, my hands sticky with blood and grime, punching in the numbers as I pull Sadie down the aisle and towards the doors of the church. 911, what is your emergency? I falter, unsure of what to say. Listen, my sister and I are being hunted. Some kind of religious cult wants us. We need the police. There were a few beats of silence. A uh, cult? I sigh. Yes, a cult. They want to make my sister pregnant so she can give birth to the devil. We tried a church, but the priest tried to kill us, and somehow he got ripped in half, and we don't know what to do, so... Send the police. This certainly wasn't the best way to ask for help, but I'm desperate, and at this point, honesty seems like the best policy. The operator sighed. When she spoke next, her voice was tired. 911 is not a place for prank calls. 
Do you have an actual emergency? Yes, I yell. I had a sick feeling, like something is going to happen, that we needed to get out of this church now. Police or not, we had to go somewhere that wasn't fucking here. I'm never going to church again. My kids will be atheist. Fuck, I can't have kids. Fuck, I don't want kids anymore. Focus, Lorelai. I let go of Sadie's hand and squeeze my phone between my shoulder and ear as I push open the heavy church doors. The morning sun was bright and cheery. The rain had subsided. It was beautiful. A nice Friday. Suddenly, there is a shrill scream, and I grab Sadie's side and pull her towards me. A woman stands on the street, walking a dog, pointing at my sister and I. I imagine it isn't a pretty sight, us covered in blood, and I groan internally as she starts stalking towards us. Sadie, let's go, as I grab her hand. We shuffle in the opposite direction, away from the church and this woman. I realize our chances of staying discreet are slim. Two teenagers, covered in blood, strolling out of the church on a beautiful morning. It's not until my phone buzzes with a text when I realize that the 911 operator has hung up on me. I glance down at my phone. Unknown number. As I pull Sadie along, taking some sort of security in the foliage, I open the text. 17 Carpenter Street. We will give you shelter. Lucifer does not condone your suffering. You will not be hurt. Fuck, I whisper. Considering we don't have a great track record with organized groups, I'm skeptical. I glance at Sadie as she stares stoically ahead, following my footsteps. I cannot protect her alone. We have nowhere to go, but nowhere will kill us once Mommy Dearest or Father Vincent's cronies catch up. It's a rock and a hard place, my friends and my intuition tells me that this is a risk I am willing to take. I take a deep breath as I pull up my GPS. As Sadie and I crouch in the foliage behind the church, I anxiously tap my fingers against my phone screen, waiting for my GPS to boot up. My phone is, without a doubt, disgusting, caked with dried blood and dirt. Finding root flashes on my screen, for a second, then two, then three, and as I prepare to fling my phone towards the church wall in frustration, it finally speaks to me. Directions to 17 Carpenter Street. In 300 feet, take a right on Hawkins Road. Nice. 11-minute walk. We can do that. Probably faster if we put some pep in our step. Only problem is that were covered in blood, which doesn't usually bode well in cushy residential neighborhoods. Before I relace Sadie's fingers with my own, I pulled the hood of her hoodie up and around her face, pulling the strings to obscure her forehead. We start walking, quickly as our tired and famished bodies would allow. Keep your head down. Walk quickly. Don't make any noise. The luck we do have is that it is early, painfully early. Few, save for that old lady, would be walking their dogs or even leaving for work at 5.08 a.m. Nevertheless, my eyes flicker from left to right as we scuttle along the side of the road, looking for threats, people. A right onto Hawkins turns into a left on Proud, across a crosswalk, and half a loop around a roundabout. A dog eyes us from a front yard, but does not bark, opting for flopping in the shade and following us with his eyes instead. We freeze as we spot a jogger perpendicular up ahead, and crouch behind a bush until he is out of sight. And finally, by the good grace of God, or Satan, who knows, we arrive. 17 Carpenter Street the white 17 on the left of the door hangs by a corner, a bit chipped, but certainly legible. And in this moment, it's the best sight of my life. 
I knock on the door, my memory flashing back to Father Vincent and the Grand Church. I have no time to second-guess myself, because in mere seconds the door swings open and arms are tugging us inside the foyer. I flinch as the door slams behind us. I am face to face with a woman, not much older than I, blonde hair tucked into twin braids and freckles dotting her face. You made it. Her face breaks into a grin. Guys, they made it. She looks us up and down. I can't imagine what you two have been through. Please, let us help you. I shouldn't trust this woman. She could very easily be out to kill me, kill Sadie, do worse. But I am tired, and for once, my mind is not screaming at me to run. So, I let her pull me into a living room and sit me on the couch, where Sadie sits next to me, her eyes locked on my face. I take inventory of the room and realize Sadie and I are outnumbered. There are five people surrounding us, clutching blankets and towels, offering us water and what looks to be like mac and cheese. Sadie burrows her head into my side as a man offers her a glass, and I wrap a protective arm around her. Guys, give them space, the blonde woman says, and there is shuffling as the other four back up, flustered. Lori, Sadie, welcome. Who are you? I bark, cringing at my tone. Mom would scold me if I was that rude to a stranger. But Mom wants me dead, so her morals don't seem to matter right now. The man standing next to the blonde speaks up. He is incredibly tall and lean, crossing muscular arms over his chest. We won't hurt you. We can explain everything if you let us. A young woman with tightly curled hair and dark skin clears her throat. We're followers of Lucifer, but certainly not the sect of your mother. An older gentleman with graying tufts of hair poking out of his scalp scoffs. Your mother is a fucking nutjob, he mutters. Ed, the blonde woman admonishes. Don't swear, they're children. Well, that pisses me off. For the first time since entering the house, I speak. I'm not a child, I sneer, and we've certainly seen and heard worse than fuck over the last day or two. The woman reddens, while the old man nods and offers us a half-smile. I'm sure. Listen, I'm Ed, condescending Barbie to my right. The woman bristles, but does not interrupt. Is Madison, Mr. Schwarzenegger over there. He gestures to the tall man with the muscles. Is Zack. Zack nods, arms still crossed. I'm Nyla, the curly-haired woman interrupts. And that is... Her voice trails off. There is one more man in the living room, the only one who has not spoken. We lock eyes, and I notice a small scar above his left eyebrow, a larger keloid running down his cheek puffy and raised. His hair is red and shaggy, and his eyes are wide and green, staring into mine. Average height, skinny build, giving me a sort of Satanist shaggy vibe. Nyla shrugs. Well, we don't know who that is. Never spoke a word to us before. Just call him Ginger. She rolls her eyes at Madison's scowl. It's a term of endearment, Mads, Anyways, he makes some mean mac and cheese, so dig in. She dishes out two paper bowls with plastic forks, while Zack places two bottles of water in front of us. Don't eat it, Sadie, I say on impulse. She whimpers, but places down the fork, and I follow suit, despite my nagging hunger pangs. Ed shakes his head before plucking Sadie's fork from her fingers, digging it into the mac and cheese and shoving a glob into his mouth before shoving the fork into my bowl and doing the same. We get poisoned, he mutters, words muffled as he chews. We go down together. I look at Sadie and shrug. Fuck it. I guess there are worse ways to go. 
As we begin to eat, Ed continues to talk, swallowing his mouthful. So, seems like Mommy is a little pissed off at Daughter Dearest for being sterile, so now she's deciding to take it out on a preteen who still plays on the monkey bars at recess. Hey, Sadie retorts. I'm 13, actually, and I don't use the monkey bars anymore. I crack open my water bottle and begin to chug. I have never in my damn life tasted water so good, and I down three-fourths of the bottle in one swig. Ed continues. Right. Anyways, here's the deal. People like your crazy mother are the type to give us a bad name. We certainly don't run around raping minors. Catholicism isn't our speed. Nyla shakes her head. It's sick and vile. We've been keeping tabs on your mother for a while, but we never knew that she would go this far, or that she was this unhinged. We figured she was going to wait until one of you got married before she dropped the bomb about the whole Antichrist thing. Like, at least until you're in college. So, it's true? I question. Like, about me and Sadie. We're, like, the devil's children? Madison rubs the back of her neck. Kind of. Someone in your bloodline fornicated with Lucifer when he walked the earth. Like, I'm talking thousands of years ago. We don't know how or what vessel he used, but when he did so, he ensured a second coming, when the time was right. But considering how your family tree has been littered with exclusively daughters over the past three generations, the time seems to be overdue. Nyla rolls her eyes. Fucking patriarchy. Zack interrupts. Your mother panicked, because when you discovered your infertility, it fell to Sadie to continue the bloodline. People like your mother, Ed continues, believe that the second coming can be forced or manipulated into manifestation, and your mother feels responsible to do so, no matter what it means for you to. I tighten my grip on the couch. And what do you believe? Ed grimaces. Well, we believe that your mother is full of shit, and that if Lucifer wanted a second coming on Earth, he would find his own means that do not involve raping kids or killing teenagers. Sadie's voice perks up. No offense, but aren't you, like, evil? Like, the devil is evil. Lucifer is the devil. I don't get why you would want to help us. Common misconception, says Nyla. The devil isn't real. It's a fear tactic to keep you from questioning. Lucifer was abandoned for questioning God. We believe in skepticism. And we do not believe in a fear of eternal damnation to distinguish right from wrong. Enlightenment, adds Madison. Lucifer leads us to enlightenment, progression, protection of our world natural human development of our own moral compasses, not evil. Okay, I interrupt, polishing off my mac and cheese. Ginger moves to sweep the bowl from my lap, disappearing into another room. We get it, you're cool, Lucifer's cool, whatever. So, how the fuck did Sadie rip a man in half? How did you get my phone number? Where the fuck do we go from here? There's a pause, a couple beats of silence as the group mulls my questions over. Madison looks at her feet. Zack recrosses his arms. Nyla purses her lips. Finally, Ed speaks up. Well, you got some powerful genes, that's for sure. My guess is, when your life was threatened, that power decided to make an appearance and protect you from Father Dahmer. As for your phone number, Madison adds, we've known that since you got your first razor three years ago. You're kind of like Harry Potter in our world. As for where you should go next, Zack ponders, we haven't really made it that far, but... Suddenly, the song Down by Jay Sean starts emanating from my phone. 
Sadie laughs for the first time in what seems like forever. That's your ringtone, Lori? Shut up, I spit, habitually flipping it into my lap to look at the caller ID. The song continues, and I realize who it is that's calling. It's Mom, I gasp. Sadie, it's Mom. Jay Sean echoes in the living room. No other voices are heard. Well, answer it, Ed says. Madison whips around to face him. Are you insane? Ed shrugs. Maybe, but I want to see what the fuck she has to say. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. She wants to kill you. Do not pick up the phone. Mom? I sputter into the receiver. Sadie sniffles a squeal beside me. Lorelai. Her voice is soft and sweet, and I almost break into tears right then and there. It's the same voice that held me when I was sick, stroked my hair as I sobbed over losing a boyfriend, whispered stories of adventures and romance when I asked about my father. However wicked she may be, how I long to hear her voice again. Mom, what do you want from us? I can't help the tears that begin to choke up, one already sliding down my face. Sadie slaps my arm repeatedly. What is she saying? Sweet Lori, my mother replies. I just want you home. Come home to me. Mom, I cry. Don't you realize what you're saying? What you're doing? Sadie doesn't deserve this, Mom. I'm sobbing into the phone now. Sadie continues to slap my arm, thigh, craning over to hear Mom's voice on the other end of the line. There is a gentle hand on my back, and I turn slightly to realize that it's Madison, rubbing her palm in smooth circles, her eyes filled with sympathy. You just don't understand, sweetheart. You can serve a greater purpose than yourself. You still can, even barren. Just... Bring Sadie home, dear. We can still be a family. Together. She won't have to raise the baby alone. You're sick, I spit into the receiver as my memories of Nathan and Mom and the office flood back. You're sick and you need help. Pause. When my mom speaks again, her voice is pure ice. You're just like your father, Lorelai and you know what happened to him. My father? My father died in a work accident. He worked in construction. A crane collapsed. He was in it. He died. Simple as that. Sure was enough for me in kindergarten. What do you mean? My voice was hoarse and breathless. What are you talking about? Mom's voice rises in anger. He proved his worthlessness by giving me two damn daughters. He failed. I told him we needed to try again. He told me I was insane. Mom, I speak slowly. What happened to Dad? What did you do to Dad? Nothing but her heaving on the other end of the line. Mom, I realize I'm screeching. What did you do to Dad? Her reply is quick and razor blade sharp. Penance. There was a loud crash as the window behind the couch we were sitting on shattered. Sadie screams. The people around me jump up with a start. I drop my phone, my heart skipping in my chest. My ears are ringing, and for a moment, I fear that I am deaf, and the last sound I ever heard was the silky soft albeit cold and malicious voice of my mother. I flinch in my seat as glass and something else falls into my lap. Someone. It's Madison, gaping like a fish, sharp breaths escaping her throat as if she was being squeezed by a boa constrictor. With every heartbeat, blood pulses from her neck. In my shock and stupor, I realize that she was shot fucking shot, right next to me, and now I am screaming too. 
A strong body knocks the wind out of me, and I am pinned to the ground. Zack grunts from above me as he pulls Madison from the couch and presses his hands against her neck, blood squelching out the sides from underneath his fingertips. Fuck, Zack gasps. How'd they find us? How did they fucking find us? Sadie lays next to me, curled under the coffee table, cradling her head and tucking herself into a ball. More shots pepper through the broken glass as the rest of the room hits the deck. Ed disappears for a moment, coming back brandishing a shotgun, wheeling around as he takes refuge behind the doorframe, into the next room and aiming towards the window. Fucking bastards, he grunts, shuffling the shotgun to get a better grip. I hear laughter echo from my phone's speaker, guttural and low. Zack grimaces as he presses harder on Madison's throat, her gasps growing softer and far in between. He seems to take a different approach, plunging four grimy fingers into the wound as she hisses in protest. Maddie, I hear him strain. Don't do this, Maddie. Bang. More shots through the window. I glance up to find Nyla shooting back through the window, the recoil of her handgun threatening her balance. I find myself being shoved under the coffee table beside my sister, long arms encircling us both in what seems like a group hug, turning us away from the gunfire. Green eyes meet mine as he pulls us close. Ginger. Nyla calls over the chaos. Ed! Got a plan B in that big ancient head of yours? Ed grunts as the shotgun fires off. The smoke from its muzzle graces my nose over the chaos. Same as plan A. We raise hell. I remember when Sadie was born. Vaguely. Bits and pieces. I remember waking up one morning to my babysitter, Kendall, sliding blueberry ego waffles in the toaster and pouring me a tall glass of chocolate milk. I was confused for a couple of reasons. Mom never told me Kendall was coming. Ego waffles and chocolate milk were for the weekends, and I was supposed to be in preschool that Thursday morning, not tucked into bed. It's a special day, Lori. Mom's having the baby. Where is Mommy and Daddy? The hospital, sweetheart, Kendall says, pushing my plate towards me. Are you excited to meet your new baby brother or sister? Not really. When I first learned Mom was having a baby, I cried. Selfish little brat I was. I had gotten quite used to being the only child, and by consequence, the center of attention. Dad kept an old scrapbook of Sadie and I growing up and there's one picture he always loved to show us of me holding Sadie after they brought her home. I am scowling and pursing my lips, my face screwed up and glaring at the bundle placed precariously in my arms. He would hold me in his lap and point at the pictures, flipping through the memories he meticulously compiled. Sadie and I at the beach in our matching bikinis, me grinning in my Cinderella Halloween costume, holding a pillowcase full of candy almost as big as me. I can see those pictures when I close my eyes, hear Dad's voice float over my head. I wish I took the time to look at his face. Mom always wanted another kid. I heard them fighting about it once. Deanna, we agreed on two. We can't fit another kid in here. I want a boy, Felix. We must have a son. What's wrong with our daughters? Nothing, but you know that... Will you shut up about the stupid prophecy? It's not real, Deanna. You're insane. He died a few months later. I hadn't always been the best sister, but I tried my best. I guess you could say she grew on me. Sadie is ultra-sensitive a little rude, and always talks during movies. But she also is kind and inherently caring. Qualities I don't, didn't, don't have. 
I miss my dad. I miss my mom, too. For a mere moment, under that table, Ginger hugging me tight and Sadie shaking beside me, I feel like a child wanting to be loved. I exhale in his grip, closing my eyes and pretending for a second or two that everything is fine and that Sadie is complaining about her English project, and I'm scheming to get my hands on some cheap liquor, courtesy of a friend's older cousin from the liberal arts college nearby. Another gunshot brings me back to reality, coupled with Sadie's shriek in my ear. I am back under the table. I glance to my right. Zack slowly removes his hands from Madison's neck, shaking his head and gritting his teeth. Her eyes stare at the ceiling as blood oozes from the wound, considerably slower than it was moments before. Shit, he whispers as he laces his hands behind his back. Sadie follows my gaze before breaking down into tears once more. Shh, I murmur. Don't look over there. Look at me. At me, Sadie. The gunfire slows before stopping completely. The ringing in my ears, coupled with the heavy breathing of everyone in the room, is a sound I fear I may never forget. Well... Not everyone. Madison is dead. Probably because of me. If we didn't come to this house, she would probably still be alive. Great job, Lori. Are they gone? Nyla questions, breathless. I think I got one. Don't know if they're dead, though. No, Ed responds, tightening his grip on the shotgun. They must be regrouping. Now that they know where the kids are, there's no way in hell they're leaving until they get what they came for. Ginger releases us from his grip. Sweat drips through his hair and trails down his face and neck. The look he gives me is a melting pot of emotions. Fear, sadness, and certainly an air of hopelessness. With no words, his expression seems to say it all. We are fucked. So, I decide to do something I had never done before. At Zoe's house, I've sat through grace before meals, where they thank God and spout out some prayer mumbo-jumbo I've never learned. I've always sat and waited for it to be over, still and polite, mulling over how hot her older brother is and whether or not these mashed potatoes will be as good as Mom's. I had never taken the time to pray myself, but... There's a first time for everything. I close my eyes and tilt my head to the ground like Zoe does. Dear whoever is out there, please help me. I'm out of ideas. Everyone is dying. If you're out there, you're doing a shit job at protecting us. Sorry, I, I didn't mean that. Just, like, do your thing. Amen. Is amen what you say, or is that a Jesus-specific thing? Ed brings me back to the present. Ah, fuck, he murmurs, standing over Madison's body. She was a good kid. Annoying as fuck, but a good kid. Had more good in her heart than the lot of us combined. Are you sure she's dead? Nyla says, and her voice is wobbly. I peek from under the table and take note of her glassy eyes. Zack nods. Yeah, bullet tore right through her jugular, bled out in minutes. He extends two fingers to her face and gently closes her eyes. A hush falls over the room. After a moment, Ed breaks the silence. We mourn later, for now, we got a band of hooligans planning their next attack. Zack rocks back on his heels. Why would they just blindly shoot through the window? Sadie gets sniped, it's all over. Why would they take that risk? Either they've got some sort of COD sniper or a boatload of stupidity. Probably both. Maybe they wanted to scare us. Called off the shootout once they got Mads. Nyla tucks the gun back into the holster wrapped around her waist. The doorbell rings. 
We freeze as the firm knocking on the door reverberates through the house. Who's that? Who the fuck you think it is? The fucking pizza delivery man? Ed snarls. It's them. Them rolls off his tongue in disgust, as if the mere word sickens him. Why on earth would they ring the doorbell? I hiss, finding my voice. Didn't think they were one for common courtesies. Sadie slowly crawls out from under the table. I follow, gripping her hand and pushing us both against the wall next to the sofa. Ginger settles next to us. What do we do? Nyla hisses. We prep for any type of invasion, not them ringing the fucking bell. The doorbell rings again. A male voice calls from outside. Fellow followers, we've come to bargain. My heart clenches in my chest. Nathan. A covert glance at Sadie shows me she recognizes him too. Her face is ghostly white, shoulders trembling. Shut up, Dr. Strange, Nyla shouts. We're doing no fucking bargaining. You haven't even heard what we have to offer, comes Nathan's voice from the outside. We have all the chips here, asshole, Nyla calls back. Nothing you could possibly offer us will give that up. A fragile female voice I don't recognize shouts from outside. Can we at least come inside and have this conversation? I'm afraid my old bones can't take much more of this heat. Fuck you and your old bones, Grandma, Nyla replies. Ed walks towards the door and gently pushes Nyla aside. Let me handle this. He leans against the doorframe, slugging his rifle over his shoulder. Don't get any funny ideas, you bastards. The girl is with us. You make any stupid moves, she gets blown to smithereens. Don't think we won't. Sadie winces next to me, and I sling my arm over her shoulder, pulling her to my chest. I whisper into her ear, they're just saying that so they don't hurt us. No one is going to shoot you. Nathan laughs. Oh, trust me, Ed. I don't underestimate you. We all know you're capable of spilling some blood. Perverts are my game of choice, Ed retorts. Nathan pauses. At least listen to my bargain. You're surrounded, Ed. I know you're usually not one for picking the short straw, but you ran out of luck this time. Janice picked the right morning to walk her dog. I hear a faint and high laugh from outside the door. The fucking woman walking her dog. She's one of them. She saw you. She called them. You're a fucking idiot, Lorelai. You give us Sadie. You keep Lorelai. And you get the book. The fuck is the book? Nyla gasps, clasping her hands over her mouth. Zack narrows his eyebrows. Ed seems suddenly interested, tipping his head against the door to hear better. Fuck you, Ed whispers. You don't have the book. There's no way they have the book, Nyla whispers frantically. It's in, like, Brazil or something. I thought it was in South Africa, Zack whispers, his fists clenched. Nyla is almost hysterical. Wherever it fucking is, it's not here. What is the book? I ask, voice rising. What the fuck is the book? I can barely hear Janice from the other side of the door. The girl's mother has kept it. She just wants them home. She's willing to exchange the book for Sadie. Imagine, my friends, a descendant of our maker and his book. Imagine what power you could have. Excuse me, I am almost shouting now, jumping to my feet. What the fuck is the book? Lori, Nathan cheers from outside. How lovely it is to hear your voice again. 
Fuck you, I cry, filled with a hatred I had never quite experienced before. I cross the living room and up to the door. Fuck you and your stupid book, and fuck all these things I don't know about. Take one fucking step through this door and Sadie will rip you in half, just like she fucking did to that creeper priest. Ed jabs me in my ribcage. And if you want to fucking talk, fucking bargain. You talk to me, not anyone else. Me. I realize I am throwing a tantrum, but I'm far too fed up to care. So, I continue, take your stupid fucking book and your stupid fucking wizard devil pentagram shit and fucking shove it, because I am going to fucking end you. I turn to Ed and shove him, hard. He nearly flies into the back wall, gasping for breath. My hands are tingling and I can hardly see straight. An arm that is not my own, is my own, reaches towards the lock on the door and untwists it, shouting behind me to stop, die down as I swing open the door. Standing in front of me are three people. Nathan, his belt buckle glinting in the sunlight, his balding head shiny and slick. The lady from before who was walking her dog, prim and proper, wrinkles sprouting across her forehead and cheeks. And at last, there is my mother, her eyes filled with worry, dried blood pasted to her forehead where I bludgeoned her with a femur bone a day and a half prior. We lock eyes. You know, Lori, it's normal to experience some hormonal changes at your age, especially with menopause. I open my mouth to scream. Nathan immediately reaches for me, seizing me by my waist and spinning me around to face the room. The cold touch of a knife settles on my throat, and I realize that Nathan is holding the blade to my neck, as I had done to Sadie hours prior. Ed is still on the floor, sputtering for breath. Nyla and Zack have their guns trained on my mother and Janice. Sadie is huddled in the corner head tucked between her knees, sobbing. Ginger is crouching beside her. I can feel Nathan's hot breath in my ear, in my face, as I have no choice but to inhale his scent. This is it, folks, he bellows. Sister for a sister. Give us the youngin, and they both live. My rage grows as the knife catches the ceiling light and traces across my neck. My heart pounds louder as I see my sister in the corner, raising her head to look at me, tears staining her blotchy cheeks. I think of many things in this moment. I think of Nathan and the belt. I think of the doctor's sympathetic gaze in the examination room. The man at the 7-Eleven and the girl who was shot on the bus. Father Vincent's finger under my chin. The woman, lifeless on the floor, meters from my feet. The one who had rubbed my back as I cried. I think of Dad and the scrapbook. There is a boiling in my belly and a tingle in my toes. Ed pushes himself up by his forearms. Raise hell, Lorelai he whispers. There is a knife to my throat. My mother wants me dead. My sister is helpless and terrified. But for the first time in a long time, I am not afraid. So you're leaving? Is that what's going on? You're just giving up on us? My father shook his head and furrowed his brow, taking a moment to readjust the hefty duffel on his shoulder. That's not what's happening, and you know it. I just need a few days to think, damn it. I was watching from the living room. My Barbie felt heavy in my hand, I remember that much. One glittering pink heel on, one off. She wore a skirt I made of tissue paper, lazily taped around her waist, because I had a habit of designing my own wedding dresses. You're giving up, 
my mother accused. You're giving up on Lori and Sadie. Sadie was down for a nap a few doors over. I glanced in the direction of her room, as did my father. You know that's not... My mother interrupted. Lori, she said, turning towards me. Do you see what's happening? Your father doesn't love you anymore. He's leaving because he doesn't want you anymore. Dad turned white as a ghost. Lori, that's not... That's not it, he stammered. Go to your room. No, Mom hissed, whipping around to face him. I want her to stay. I want her to watch you walk out of her life. I want her to see it. Mom and I lock eyes again as I grip Barbie by her hair. He's leaving you. He hates you. My vision was blurred by my tears, and I began to blubber, pleas and shouts dropping from my young lips. Mom shouts over my cries. Sadie begins to cry from somewhere else in the house, stirring awake from her nap. Look at what you've done, Felix. Look at what you've done. My eyes snap open. The blade of Nathan's knife rests on my throat, and I can feel his arm slung around my waist, the sweat from his balding head dripping into my mangled hair. My mother and Janice slowly enter the foyer from the outside, and the click of the door locking into place pounds in my ears like a drum. Get the fuck off of me, I scream. My right hand grasps his forearm and wrenches the limb away from my neck as he cries out and stumbles backwards, gripping his arm and howling, almost knocking over Janice and my mother, who scramble to the side. I whip around to face him as he raises a shaking arm in horror. The smell of burnt flesh lingers in the air. A small handprint circles Nathan's arm, soaking into his burning flesh as his skin begins to bubble and pop. A thick brand quickly forming, leaking blood and yellowing pus, a thin layer of charcoal tinging the edges. Nathan hisses as steam escapes his wound, his arm twitching violently as he tenses his hand. Fucking bitch burned me, Nathan yells, as Janice's face turns a sickly shade of green and my mother claps her hands over her mouth. A couple of days ago, a burn like that might have made me sick, but my stomach hardly turns at the sight. My nose doesn't scrunch at the wafting odor of burnt flesh and boiling blood. I welcome it. It belongs there, on his body, and a part of me takes pleasure in the fact that I have branded him forever. Me. Lori. Daughter of... My mind stalls for a moment as I extend an arm forward and grip the front of Nathan's shirt. A short tug sends him barreling inside, and he yells at the sudden jolt, the hissing of bursting veins and vessels in his charred arm growing louder. The fabric bunched between my fingertips feels disgusting in my grip. He writhes in pain as I take my left hand and clap it against his shoulder, Nathan's scream fills the small room, and I embrace it, letting it flood my veins and make its way down to my aching fingertips. He drops to his knees and squirms, eyes wide and terrified. They remind me of Sadie's eyes that day in Mom's office as Nathan reached for his belt. The thought fuels me further. I think there are people shouting behind me, but I am unsure. My eyes are locked on Nathan's as I lower down to his level. Please, he begs, blood from his shoulder leaking through his sleeve and staining his back. Please, don't kill me. Have mercy. The voice that leaves my throat is barely my own. It is darker and raspier, and invites goosebumps under my skin, prickling up beneath my sweatshirt. I barely notice over the humming in my chest, and the heat bubbling in my stomach. I gave up on mercy a long time ago. With that, I encircle my hand around Nathan's burnt arm once more. Over his screams, I steady my stance and throw him into the wall in front of me. His scream cuts off as he makes contact, his head smacking into the drywall. 
He crumples in a heap against the wall of the foyer, head cocked at an unnatural angle. The only movement is that of the handprint-shaped burns on his arm and shoulder, spreading slowly and steadily across his chest. Fresh blood leaks out of his mouth, a stark contrast to the cauterized, burnt blood dribbling out of his wounds. I take a breath. My eyes flutter to the doorway where Janice and my mother stand, still as statues. Silence for one beat, then two. Janice quivers, tears filling her eyes. He's dead. You killed him. I clench my fists. Shut up, I scream, marching towards her and grasping her by her thinning hair. In one fluid motion, Janice flies towards the other side of the room, whizzing by Ed and Nyla and crashing into a rickety bookshelf near the entrance to the kitchen. The crack of her bones reverberates through the air. A sharp shred of wood finds its way into her abdomen with a squelch. She does not have a chance to scream. It is then I take in the scene around me. Sadie is no longer crying. Instead, she is quivering in Ginger's arms as he turns her away from the sight of the bodies and towards the corner of the room. Ed has made his way to his feet, slightly wheezing, leaning against the wall for support. I cannot read his expression. My eyes flutter to the other side of the room. Nyla's expression is quite clear. Fear. Her chest rises and falls in smooth motions, but her eyes are wide and locked on the blood dribbling out of Nathan's mouth. Zack's arm has found its way around my mother's neck in a death grip, but his face is less stoic than it usually is. Awe flicks across his features, his brows slightly raised. If I squint, his lips might be tugged up slightly in a smile. My mother's head looks tiny peeking above Zack's huge arm. Her expression is one that I remember quite clearly, the face she made at the doctor's once she pronounced me infertile. It is one of blatant shock and sadness and a hint of rage behind her eyes. She doesn't quite look like Supermom anymore. She looks... small. As meek as she may look, Mom has never had trouble finding her voice. It cuts across the silence, and it is the sound that breaks me from my murderous trance and brings me back to myself. Back to Lori. The Lori who can't run a sub-ten-minute mile or pull off more than ten push-ups. Lorelai... She whispers, Lori, look around you. Look at what you've done. Shut up, mutters Zack, tightening his grip. Keep your damn mouth shut. My eyes flicker to Nathan and Janice and their mangled bodies. In a strange turn of events, my mind wanders to Janice's dog. Who will walk him now? I look down at my feet with a long exhale as Mom continues to speak. You killed them, Lori. You killed those people with your bare hands. And they begged for you to stop, didn't they? Shut up, mutters Zack, his strong arm squeezing against my mother's trachea. Her voice is a bit wheezy under his hold, but she carries on. I cannot help but stare at her. I feel heavy. My legs feel like jelly. Only Mom's voice could do this to me. Nobody was meant to die, Mom whispers. No one was meant to get hurt. Look around you, honey. Three dead bodies in a matter of hours. This wasn't supposed to happen. I'll fucking kill you, Zack murmurs. No, I say, my voice hoarse. I didn't mean for it to happen. I had to protect us. Sadie. I had to protect Sadie. Mom laughs. Zack's muscles twitch, and her laugh turns into a gasp. Zack, I say. Let go of her. Zack shook his head. No way. I meet his eyes. Now. Ed speaks up. Zack. 
With a shake of his head and a glance of disapproval, Zack releases my mother. Her laugh grows louder as she takes a step towards me. Protect Sadie? You really think you've been protecting Sadie? Sadie's faced death more times than I could count on your little escapade. Taking her to church, Lorelai? You're lucky the ceiling didn't crash. I was doing my best, I spit. We weren't really left with many options. Mom shakes her head. Tell me, Lori, was this little mission worth it? Where's your body count now? Must be nearing the double digits. Running around, killing anyone who gets in your way. All for what? Tears blur my vision. I blink them away. I... I didn't mean to kill anyone. Ha! <laughs> Mom barks. Sweetheart, you enjoyed it. Don't pretend you didn't. Don't pretend you're not trying to compensate for your lack of womanhood by playing some sort of savior. The last word rolls off her tongue, sarcasm dripping from her voice. She takes a stray strand of my hair and tucks it behind my ear. I let her. She shakes her head as her hand rests on my face. Where's the end game, Lori? You kill your own mother and run off with your sister in some ragtag band of traitors? Running is something I suppose you're destined to be good at. Your dad was great at it, after all. I bristle. You killed dad. Mom shrugs. He didn't quite understand our circumstances, she exhales. But you are not one to talk about killing, my sweet. You'll never be able to control that monster inside of you. You're destined to destroy. Come home. We can figure this out together. I'm a good person, I sputter as my stomach turns. I'm a good person. Nyla interrupts from behind us, voice shaking. Just kill her, Lori. She's trying to guilt you. Mom raises a brow at me, expectantly. My eyes fall to my feet. I... I can't. Mom snorts. Of course you can't. You can run around burning holes in people's heads and throwing them into walls, but you could never. A horrible noise interrupts Mom's words. It is a squelch, a crack, a sick ripping and tearing all in one. Mom's mouth gapes open as she falls to the floor in a heap at my feet. Well, most of her, anyways. My eyes snap up, still as a statue, grasping my mother by her hair, is Sadie. Blood pours from my mom's severed head and crashes at my feet in a red waterfall. It soaks into her body below, mixing with the blood pumping out of her neck. Nerve endings and an inch or two of spinal cord pokes out from Mom's headless corpse. Sadie just ripped our mother's head off. I can, Sadie says, voice dull and monotone. She sighs as she releases Mom's hair, and her head slams into the floor, skull cracking, rolling an inch or two before settling a mere foot from her body. Sadie and I lock eyes and stare at each other. Sadie's eyes are wet with tears, but besides that, her face is stoic and calm. I feel a single tear fall down my face as I take her into my arms, sobbing. Her arms wrap around me as I cry my tears, legs shaking. We both fall to our knees next to Mom's corpse. Sadie tips her head against my shoulder as I cry, every emotion flooding through me as tears rack my body and I feel myself shudder in her embrace. Is it over? I whisper. Yeah, Sadie says. It's over now. The old sedan sputters as it rolls down the highway. I glance out the window. Sadie's hand in mine as she leans on me from the middle seat, fast asleep. 
Nyla sits to her right. This car sucks, Nyla says. Shut your trap, barks Ed, with a hint of playfulness in his voice as he grips the steering wheel. This beauty has been in the family for 35 years, and she's still on her A-game. Zack fiddles with the radio from the passenger seat, static rising and falling as he attempts to find a station. Reception here is shit, he mutters. Can't find any good music for the life of me. Nyla turns herself around to the back, where Ginger is draped across the seats, flipping through a magazine. You doing okay back there? she questions. Ginger nods before returning to his reading. Are we almost there yet? I ask. Ed nods. Just a couple miles to go. We get off at that exit, find the motel, and head to the hospital ASAP. You sure this is safe? I question. This lady is the best gynecological surgeon in the state, Ed responds. Was more than happy to help when I called her up. She can get Sadie in and done tomorrow. We will let her recover for a few days, then we head west. Got some friends on that side of the country who are more than willing to help us crash till we figure out our next move. How do you have so many connections? Nyla asks. Ed laughs. You know me. I've got friends everywhere. Silence settles in the car as Zack finally finds a working radio station. Lady Gaga's Just Dance pumps through the speakers. Ed snorts. What on earth is this? Maddie liked this song. Zack explains. Ed pauses. After a moment, he reaches for the volume dial and turns it a few notches higher. Zack awkwardly clears his throat. Listen, Lori, there's something we've been meaning to give to you. Found it with your mom. He reaches into his backpack and pulls out a small black journal, leather fraying at the edges with yellow stained pages. This book is, well, pretty important. We believe it was written by Lucifer when he walked the earth. Not sure what's exactly in it, but it might have some of the answers you're looking for. Maybe give you some better insight into what kinds of powers you and Sadie might have. I take it from Zack and glance at it in my lap. Lucifer had a diary? He shrugs. Again, not sure what's in it. We figured it was best for you and Sadie to hold on to it. Do with it what you will. My thumb traces the cracks on the cover as I nod. With a twinge of nerves in my belly, I flip open the cover, only to find a few words in chicken scratch handwriting, etched across the entirety of the first page in jumbled sizes. Daughter of mine, your strength knows no bounds. <laughs> 